Throughout this series, we have seen the testing of faith by the wicked and by the evil. When he was just a teenager, we saw where Daniel, where he stood by the conviction of faith that was in his heart as he stood against Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar's evil wishes. Then as an old man, Daniel, with disciplined faith, he calmly endured a den of lions. We also saw the testing of faith when it came to Daniel's friends, who again, with a strong conviction, they chose not to bow down to again, the evil and the wicked desires of Nebuchadnezzar. They chose to surrender to the will of God. And in surrendering to the will of God, we saw that they were not only able to endure the flames of a fiery furnace, but they were delivered from the fiery furnace, that they were delivered from the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. I say to you today that there is a wicked and an evil spirit that is in our world today. There is a wicked and an evil spirit that is in our world today that troubles and grieves the soul. You may not think it, but today I say to you that we have reason to rejoice. No matter how much the wicked and the evil spirit, no matter how much it troubles us today, I tell you today that we still have reason to rejoice. We have seen that victory has been promised. We have seen that victory has been assured to us. And so today I say that you and I, that we should pick ourselves up in this fight. We should pick ourselves up in this battle today. And we should move onward to victory. Will you join me today in moving onward to victory? This is a word of encouragement that has to be continuously repeated today. And again, the reason why I say that is because so many of us, we are moving as if we are losing this fight. Many of us, we are moving as if we are losing in the battle of good and evil. Do you think that we are losing today? But many of us, many of us, we seem to be moving with our heads hanging down as if we are losing this battle. Why is that? Why, why don't many of us, why aren't we moving in the assurance of, of the victory that has been promised to us by the Lord, our God? We should be again moving in confidence of the promise. We should be moving with great rejoicing in our heart of the assurance of victory. But again, many of us, we are hanging our heads today. But again, I say today that we have reason to rejoice today. But why aren't we doing it? This is a thought that brings us back to Daniel this week. To where there in the fifth, the 15th verse there in the seventh chapter of Daniel. We'll see that Daniel, he expressed that he was grieved in his spirit within his body. What was the cause of his grief? Well, again, we saw this in, in partly in our Sunday school lesson for this week. But in the first half of Daniel, we'll see two visions that Daniel had. He had a couple of visions, which Daniel, he tells us in the first verse there, he tells us that he wrote them down, telling the main facts. Like Daniel, I say to you today that we too have also been given visions of the future. We have been given a revelation about the future through Christ himself. Jesus, if you don't remember this, he shared with all of us that in his father's house are many mansions, he said. 
And he said that he is preparing a place for us. Do y'all remember Jesus saying that? Then when he said that, I don't know if y'all will remember this. I hope that you will, because we should keep this near and dear to our hearts. Jesus said that he is coming again to receive both me and you to himself. Y'all remember that? Then over in the revelation of Christ, we are shown the vision of a new heaven and a new earth that comes forth. That's in the 21st chapter of Revelation, by the way, in the first verse, where, where John said that he saw the new heaven and the new earth coming forth, and he said that this old, this old earth, the old creation, John said that, that it passed away, that, that it was no more. If you don't think that God has given you a vision, a revelation of the future, Think again. It's there in the word for us today. See, in this revelation of the future, we who are of sincere faith, we are seen reigning with our Lord, our God, in the 22nd chapter. Where we reign with our Lord, not temporarily, but forever and ever. Such a vision and a revelation, I say to you today, it should be reason for you to rejoice, right? Yet yeah, again, many of us, we are grieving in our soul today. Why is that? Why aren't you rejoicing today? Let's try to understand Daniel's cause for grief there in the 15th verse. I feel like if we can understand Daniel's cause for grief since he had a vision and we have had a vision, I feel like that maybe his cause of grief, maybe it's similar to why some of us are grieving in our soul today, why some of us may be troubled today. So Daniel's first vision, which is recorded from the first through the eighth verse there, we'll see that it was about four beasts, which Daniel, he said that the four beasts, they came up from the sea. That's what we see there from the first through the eighth verse, if you're taking a look at it there. The four beasts, the scripture tells us that they were all different from each other, both in looks and then in how terrible they all were. Daniel, a man who was given the gift to understand and to be able to interpret dreams by the Lord, we'll see that he was struggling to understand the visions of this chapter. And so we'll see there in the 16th verse that Daniel, we, we'll see there that he chose to ask one of those who stood by for the truth of the visions. One of those that, that stood by, that is in reference to the angels. You see, Daniel in the second vision, it shows us that he was in the throne room of the Lord, our God, of the sovereign one. And so in the throne room of the Lord, Daniel, as you'll see there in the 10th verse, he was surrounded by a great multitude, a multitude that was, was made up of angels. And so Daniel, he was, he was trying to find clarity. Daniel, he was trying to, to find some understanding about, about the visions that he had there. And so seeking clarity, seeking understanding in, in that moment, okay, is him turning to the angels there. And so something that I want to share with all of you today is that you should never be afraid to seek clarity and understanding when God maybe has shown you something, but you cannot understand it. Never be afraid to seek God for help. Never be afraid to seek God for clarity and for understanding when you're troubled in your soul today. 
Because the Lord, our God, he wants you to, to know things. He wants you to have clarity. He wants you to have understanding. And so if you are lacking in your clarity and in your understanding, if your soul is troubled, don't you be afraid. Do just as Daniel, we see him do here. Seek for that assistance. Seek for that help. So we'll see the angel that the angel began to interpret Daniel's vision for him to give him some clarity there. We're told there in the 17th verse that, that Daniel, again, there he, again, was told that the four beasts were four kings that would arise out of the earth. The beast, when you take a look at Daniel's vision, they represented by their symbols, they represented Babylon, they represented Persia, Greece, and Rome. Each again of the beasts, they were terrible in their way. And as history shows us, those kingdoms or those empires, they were cruel, with, with one being worse than the other. Now, Daniel, he had already experienced the cruelty of of Babylon. And if you remember this, Daniel, when it came to him being thrown in the den of lions, he was living under the reign of Darius, who was a, a Persian king. So the Persians, they came along the way and they defeated the cruel kingdom that was Babylon. So what troubled Daniel here was these future kingdoms that would come. Daniel, he was troubled by future wickedness that would plague the land. And I began to wonder again about us today. Is that what troubles us today, the future? Because again, you and I, we can see the, the wickedness of today, can't we? We can see the evil of today. And, and we're concerned about it today and what it could mean for tomorrow. I know that's something that certainly concerns me. I don't know about all of you, but that's something that certainly concerns me. You see, some of us, we have grown tired of the wicked and the evil. We, we, we have grown tired of, of having to put up with them, having to put up with with their mess. You see, some of us, we have been putting up with them for a lifetime now, haven't we? The mere idea of, of having to, to again, put up with them even more, it begins to weigh on us, doesn't it? It begins to weigh on our soul. It begins to, to pain us. Again, the mere idea of what the wicked and the evil will be up to, what they'll be trying to do tomorrow, it makes us get tired, don't it? You see, it pains me to hear stories about, about school shootings today. I remember where I was when, when Columbine happened in 1999, when I was a freshman at Creekside. And I remember thinking to myself when that shooting happened at a school. I remember thinking to myself in 1999, oh, man, that ain't going to ever happen again. What was I wrong, huh? And again, there's racism, sexism, all the kind of phobias that you can think about, all of the prejudices and uh, the stereotypes. Here we are in 2024, September, right? Almost at the end of another year. And just take a look at what's going on in our society today. Still troubling the world. And for what reason? Because evil just can't let go of its way of wickedness. Should we be worried? Should we be grieved in our soul about the wicked and about the evil and what it is that they do? Should we stress about it? Should we be anxious about it? Something to consider as we continue to work through Daniel's grief here. 
Now in his vision, Daniel, he had seen a fourth beast that Daniel said was exceedingly strong and it was dreadful. Daniel, he was hung up on this beast. He watched as that beast devoured and left everything in his way, broken into pieces, he said there in the seventh verse. And then there in the eighth verse, Daniel, he made a note of the fact that the fourth beast that had ten horns with another little horn rising from it and speaking pompous words, that is, that it was speaking grand words. So Daniel, when we take a look at him speaking to the angel there in the 19th verse, Daniel, he wanted to know about this, this fourth beast here. Daniel, he wanted to know about that little horn that, that rose from the ten horns of that fourth beast. And so again, the angel, we'll see there, began to interpret the vision to give Daniel again more clarity and more understanding so that he could know the truth. And again, here's where I tell you today, again, reminding you, if you are ever confused about something that, that God has shown you, turn to the Lord because he wants to give you clarity so that you can know. And so again, the angel said to Daniel there that the fourth beast, that it represented a fourth kingdom of this world. The fourth beast actually represented Rome. And so the 10 horns, the angel said there represented 10 kingdoms, which in a manner of speaking has or will arise from the fourth beast. Then there in the 24th verse, the angel told Daniel that from those 10 horns will arise another horn that will subdue three of the kings, the angel said there. Then the angel told Daniel there in the 25th verse that this other horn, this little horn, will speak words, look at this, against the most high. That sounds wicked and evil, doesn't it? The angel then, again, take a look at that. The angel told Daniel that that little horn will not just speak words against the Most High, but the little horn there will persecute the saints of the Most High. And then even more, taking a look at that there, the angel pointed out that the saints will be given into the hands of the horn for a time and times and a half a time. That sounds troubling, doesn't it? With such a troubling interpretation, I believe that we can understand why it was that Daniel was so troubled in his soul, right? Why he was troubled about these visions. They don't sound all that wonderful, does it? You see, anytime we read in scripture about, about someone being given into the hands of another, that, that typically speaks to a certain defeat, doesn't it? That, that's, that speaks to defeat, to death, to doom. And, and again, when, when you think about this, Dale, he was looking at the saints of the most high. And so, so Dale, he was seeing here history repeating itself because as I said before, Dale, he had already gone through this before with the Babylonians. And so he saw history repeating itself for those who would choose to, to get yeah, walk with God. As I preached earlier in this series, that roaring lion, he don't change his ways, does he? That roaring lion, he loves to roar, to stir up a whole bunch of fear, to stir up a whole bunch of anxiety and excitement. The fear of trouble is, is one of the devil's, one of Satan's greatest weapons that, that he loves to use against us. And the reason why he roars, the reason why he loves to stir up fear is because of what fear can do to us. You see, again, when we fear, it can create doubt in our heart. 
And you see, when we have doubt in our heart, we won't go anywhere. We will not move, as you have heard me say, over and over and over again. Doubt, it can paralyze the believer. And, and I say to you today, many of us, we are paralyzed in doubt today. That's why we can't rejoice in what God has promised to us. Again, God has promised us victory over Satan. He has promised us victory over the wicked and the evil, but many of us, we doubt the Lord. We say that we believe in God, but many of us, we are filled with doubt. And, and therefore, we can't rejoice in what God has promised us. We can't rejoice in the blessing of what God has promised to us. Should we live in fear? Should we live in fear of what our wicked adversaries, what they may be up to, what they may do to us? Yeah, and we, we live in the midst of wolves, don't we? Should we let the wicked trouble us in our soul today? Such visions, again, have been given not to trouble us. This vision here of, of Daniel's here, with the four beasts, they weren't given to trouble him. What we see in the book of the revelation of Christ, that's not given to us to trouble us. Those visions, they are given to prepare us. Do you get me here? They are given to prepare us for what's to come. You see, when you know that a storm is coming, you can prepare for it, can't you? And, and when you are prepared for it, you, you feel comfortable, you feel safe in being able to better endure it, don't you? And so with that in mind, again, I say to you today, not to frighten you, not to scare you. There is a wicked and an evil spirit that is present in our world right now. What can be troubling to some of us is that the description there of that little horn, it matches someone who we find in New Testament scripture. If you don't believe me, turn over to the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians. And let's take a little, let's take a little look here at Paul's Paul's writing here. That's again the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians. Where Paul there in the third verse, he spoke of one, the lawless one. Paul spoke of who will arise after the quote unquote falling away. The falling away is in reference to a very pivotal moment that will take place in this world. It's a moment that has yet to happen, by the way. There is going to be a falling away from faith in the Lord. Again, I'm not trying to hide anything from you all today. There is going to be a falling away from the faith of God. And we already see signs of that in the world today, by the way. But there's going to be an even greater falling away from faith after the removal of the church. And when I say the removal of the church, I am talking about when Christ comes to this world and he again fulfills what is said in the 14th chapter of John's gospel. When he calls us to be with him, we call that the rapture of the church. When us true believers when we are received by Christ himself. And so with the removal of the church, a way will be made during a period of time, which again, Jesus said will happen. Where Jesus said that there's going to be tribulation in this world that has never been seen before. We call that period of time, the great tribulation. And during that period of time, during the great tribulation, 
Again, the man of sin, Paul said there in that scripture, he said that the man of sin will be revealed. The lawless one. The man of sin is in reference to the one we call the Antichrist. And Paul said there in the fourth verse that this one, the Antichrist, will oppose God and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped. That sounds like that pump his horn, doesn't it? Again, notice there, Paul said again that this one, the lawless one, the man of sin, the Antichrist, will oppose God and exalt himself above all that is called God. Then Paul, he said there that the coming of the Antichrist there in the ninth verse is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and get this circle, highlight this verse in your Bibles, lying wonders, lying wonders. And, and the sad part about all of this is that in that period of time, in that day, many will fall into his hands. They will believe the lies. They will believe the deceptions. Again, I say to you right now, today, we are in a battle. We are in a battle of good and evil. Though the Antichrist, that person, is not present today, we can feel his presence. We can feel his presence in the world today. As I said, there is a wicked and an evil spirit that is present in the world right now. And again, I'm not saying these words to you. I'm not sharing this message with you today to scare or to frighten any of you, but to prepare you today. As Paul wrote there in the seventh verse, the mystery of the lawless one is already at work. Paul, I want you to understand, Paul, he said that during his time, during his day. Paul, he lived well before we do. And so if the lawless one was already at work, if the, the spirit of the lawless one was already at work during his time, you better believe that the mystery of his work it's already at work today. John, he backed up what Paul said in his letter. John wrote, even now, many antichrists have come. John was saying that many antichrists, they were already active during his time when he was an elder. And John, he outlived Paul. But John he lived well before us. So in other words, though the person Antichrist isn't in the world yet, I want you to understand today that the spirit of Antichrist, it is certainly alive in this world today. The spirit of Antichrist Anti meaning standing in opposite. It is present. It is active in the world today. And John wrote that those who deny the Lord, that they are of the spirit of Antichrist. Such a denial, I want you to understand today, it's simply not about just saying, I don't believe in God. It's not simply about, well, I don't believe in Christ. That's part of it, but it's even more than that. There are more ways to, to deny God than simply saying that, that one doesn't believe. You see, there are many that deny the Lord today. They deny Christ today because they do not move in his way. You see, the way of Christ is a way that is of love. Y'all have heard me say that over and over and over and over and over again, haven't you? 
You see, the way of Christ is to uplift. That is the way of Christ. The way of Christ is, is not to bring down. The way of Christ is, is not to tear down. Y'all hear me here? The way of Christ is, again, that of moving out of sincere love, not that fake love, not that love that say, I love you, but then behind someone back, oh, man, you scheming against them. You plotting against them. Not that kind of love. I'm talking about sincere love, genuine love, not, not doing things just for personal gain. Now, Ian, if you don't think that the spirit of Antichrist is present in the world today, as I often tell y'all to do, just take a look around. All you have to do is observe. And if you are blind, just listen. All you have to do is be observant of the world that we live in. And if you don't believe he is present, Consider this. Consider that the person of Antichrist again will exalt himself above all things, Paul said there, thinking himself, believing himself to be higher than God. I promise you today that you don't have to look hard. You don't have to look far to find folks that exalt themselves. You don't have to look hard. You don't have to look far to find folks that believe themselves to be higher than everybody that's in the world. You don't have to look hard. You don't have to look far to find someone that raises themselves above the Lord, our God. Yes, there are people in the world today that have concepts of lording over everybody. Lord and over everybody as they are a ruler of the world. Who do you think you are? The person of Antichrist, Paul said, will deceive. Will deceive with power. Will deceive with signs. Will deceive with lying wonders. Lying wonders, I keep on repeating. Lying wonders is not real. It's a lie. Again, I tell you today, if you don't believe that the spirit of Antichrist is present in this world today, just be observant because you don't have to look hard. You don't have to look far for those who love to deceive. The wicked and the evil, they love to, to create this, this, this persona. They love to create this person of, of power. This, this, this person of, of power, this, this image of those that are, are, that are foolish enough to actually buy into and believe in that they can do it, that this person can do anything. They're foolish enough to believe in that strong person image, that strong person persona. Such wicked and evil spirit of people, they love to portray that they alone, only them, can solve the world's problems. Really? Really? You think that one man, one person can solve all the world's problems? The person that actually thinks that, they are the fool. And who's the more foolish? The fool or the one that will follow the fool? Yeah, I got that one from you, Obi-Wan. Give me a break. Give me a break. People that move being possessed with such a wicked and evil spirit, they pose a great threat. They pose a great danger, not just to themselves, but to everybody, to the world. They move only out of selfish ambition. And selfish ambition, I want you to understand today that that is a spirit that is willing to destroy everything in its path so that it can gain the world. Yeah, such a spirit, such movement, it runs in opposition 
to that of the Lord. Again, God, our Lord, who desires for, for all people to unite, for all people to, to come together and to, again, be fruitful and, and to multiply. God, he created us for us to all prosper, not some of us to prosper. You see, the spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of the wicked and the evil today, is a spirit that is anti-love. It is anti-love. It doesn't care for love. You see, at every turn, we watch today as the spirit of the wicked and the evil, the spirit of Antichrist today, as it does everything that it can to sow division in our world today. Right here at home, in fact. Why is that? Why does the spirit of Antichrist, why does it oppose unity? Think about that for a moment today. Think about it today. Because again, the spirit of the wicked and the evil is a spirit, again, that only wants itself to prosper. You see, the spirit of Antichrist, it knows, it knows that, that when we love each other, there ain't nothing that is impossible for us to do. When we work together, the spirit of Antichrist, the wicked and the evil, it knows that we can overcome. It knows that all people can prosper. Every single person, man, woman, boy, or girl, the spirit of Antichrist knows that when we stand hand in hand, all of us, we uplift each other just as God intended. So the notion that good can come from a place of bitterness, the notion that good can come from a place of hatred, Wickedness and evil, it just doesn't add up on a spiritual level. And Jesus, he said that a good tree can, cannot bear bad fruit. Jesus, he said, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Don't be telling me that no some bad tree going to bear some kind of good fruit. Don't you, you can't pull the wool over my eyes. I ain't no fool. Why are so many people today foolishly looking for good fruit under a barren and a corrupt tree? That's a mystery to me. We again, we are in a battle today, aren't we? We are in a battle today against the spirit of, of great wickedness and great evil. Are you afraid of the wicked and the evil? Are you afraid of the spirits of the wicked and the evil? We shouldn't be. We should not be afraid of the wicked and the evil. We should not be afraid of those who have the spirit of antichrist in them. What we should be is ready. We should be prepared to do battle against them. We, we should be ready to, to participate in the fight. Again, as we have seen all series low, we should be ready to stand for what is good, what is holy, what is righteous, not deemed by man, not deemed by religion, but deemed by God. You see, we should be prepared to do battle against them because again, God, he has given us the vision. Let us understand that the wicked and the evil, let us understand today that they will be defeated. God has showed it to us. You see, Daniel, he was so hung up on the beast of his vision that, that he forgot that he saw the ancient of days, as we saw in our Sunday school lesson today. He forgot that he saw the son of man. And so the angel, we'll see there in the 18th verse, the angel told Daniel, he said, the saints of the most high, 
even though the saints of the most high shall be troubled, even though they may fall into the hands of a wicked man, the angel said that the saints of the most high shall receive the kingdom. The angel said that the saints of the most high shall possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. You have reason to rejoice today. Yes, there's going to be trouble that, that we saints we f will face in this world. Yes, the wicked and the evil, they will become more and more wicked and evil in, in their way. Yet the angel pointed out to Daniel that God, he has the final say. And God's final say today, I want you to hear, is victory. It is his victory. It is victory for the righteous. It is also victory for us, the saints. And I ain't talking about the football team. I'm talking about us true believers. The angel told Daniel there in the 26th verse, said that the courts will be seated as they will take away what the horn, that little horn, take away what he thought, what, what he thought belonged to him. This world don't belong to Satan. This world don't belong to the devil. This world, it don't belong to the wicked. It don't belong to, to the evil. The man of sin, again, will be defeated. Again, in the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians, in the 8th verse, Paul, he wrote that the Lord will consume the lawless one with the breath of his mouth and destroy him with the brightness of his coming. Again, the wicked and the evil will be defeated. And again, if you don't believe in Daniel's vision, turn with me now over to the 19th chapter of the book of the Revelation of Christ. And again, you will see today a vision that John received thanks to the Lord our God that Jesus permitted for John to see. In the revelation of Christ, scripture it shows us there that there's a rider, a rider who will come on a white horse who is called faithful and true. The 11th verse there, it tells us that in righteousness, this rider, he judges and he makes war. This rider on the white horse. The name of the rider is given to us there. The name of him is the word of God. And I don't know if you all remember this, but in his gospel, in the very first verse of the first chapter of John's gospel, John wrote that in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God and the word was made flesh. The rider on that white horse whose name is the word, that's Jesus Christ there. Then look at this beautiful sight here that's shown to us as we still look at that 19th chapter of Revelation there. Coming with him, John said, will be the armies in heaven who will come riding on their own white horses. That army, I don't want y'all to get confused here. That army isn't talking about God's angels. Uh-oh. This should make y'all feel good on the inside here because that army there that's coming with him will be the saints riding on their own white horses. I don't know if y'all hear me here today, but that's you. You have your own white horse and you are going to be with Christ. That's all of us sincere believers today. The ones who they laugh at, who they mock today, say, hey, uh, you believe in that sky guy? No, I believe in more than the sky guy. I believe in the God that's right there with me now. 
I believe in the God that's right here in this room right now. I believe in the God that makes a way for me right now. I believe in the God that lifts me up over the wicked and the evil right now. And there I am. I got my own white horse. As again, the word of God, Christ, he is making war. Who is it that he's making war with? Take a look at that 20th verse there. John said that he, that he saw Jesus and the armies in heaven capture the beast and the false prophet. Both the beast and the false prophet, the scripture says there, that false prophet who worked his signs, they will be captured alive and they'll be thrown into the lake of fire. Jesus making war against the wicked and the evil. And look at the wicked and the evil there being cast into the lake of fire, being, in other words, defeated. Then those who are of sin, when you take a look at the 11th through the 15th verse in the 20th chapter of Revelation, we see them standing before the great white throne of God. And we see them just like the beast, just like that false prophet, just like Satan himself. We see them cast away from God's presence for all eternity. Again, I tell you today, God, he has the final say. And his say is victory for the saints. Yes, we may have trouble in this world today. Yes, we will have trouble in this world today. But tomorrow, tomorrow, what is promised to us is victory. Tomorrow will bring for victory for us. All of us true believers we will literally rise over the wicked and the evil, put on our immortal, our glorified bodies, and we will receive the reward of the kingdom of heaven. So I have shared this series of sermons with you because again, I don't want you to ever give up hope in this battle. I don't want you to ever hang your heads because of the wicked and because of the evil. I have shared this, this series of service with you today because my desire is for all of us to continue to move forward in hope. My desire is for us to move over to the victory that has been promised to us. And again, in order for us to do that, we must move by faith. We again must trust must believe that God has given victory into our hands. God has put the wicked and the evil. He has given them into our hands for us to defeat them. Do you believe that you will defeat the wicked and the evil? Amen. 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 Thanks for watching this week's sermon. I hope that you enjoyed this week's message and I hope that you'll share it with someone somewhere. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you like this video. Follow the channel as well as hit the alert bell so that you don't miss any notifications, so that you don't miss any of the wonderful videos that we share here on the Newfound Faith YouTube channel.